Darling, if you're going to become a drag queen, you're going to have to learn these things. All right, all of you self-proclaimed super fans of RuPaul's Drag Race out there, I'm coming for you. Today, I'm here to tell y'all what happened all throughout history so that the queen herself, RuPaul, could rule over Logo TV. And for those of you who don't know that much about drag, today we're going to talk all about the fundamentals of drag culture. So what is drag? In simplest terms, drag is a sector of gender performance just like the rest of gender. Drag performers either perform androgynously or in the opposite gender, and in most cases this means a lot of makeup, padding, and a ton of fake hair. Women who perform as men are known as drag kings, but that's not what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to be focusing on men who do drag, otherwise known as the very, very glamorous drag queen. But let's not confuse doing drag with being transgender. I mean, one is performance-based mm -hmm. and one is someone's life. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. In his book, Disidentifications, Jose Esteban Munoz defines drag as a way to resist the oppressive and normalizing discourse of dominant ideology of heteronormativity. He says that drag mediates on ways in which, through costume and performance, one continually makes self. Each outfit that is tried on displays a different modality of being queer. All of the ensembles depict different positions on a gay male subcultural spectrum. All of it is disguised, and the sequence itself works as a catalog of various queer modalities of self-presentation. There are many varieties of drag queens, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But first, a lesson in history! It's hard to pinpoint an exact moment where drag culture actually started. In ancient Greek society, women were considered inferior to men, and thus unfit for this stage. So all of the female roles in theater? Played by men. According to Playbill.com, both Plato and Socrates worried about the damaging effects of male actors degrading themselves by representing female emotions and characteristics. <laughs> they knew a lot, didn't they? This trend of excluding women is also involved in both Japanese kabuki and Shakespearean theater. More often, teenage boys would be cast instead of grown men in Shakespearean work. In the Victorian era, men performed as women, but women also began to perform male roles as well. The most popular example of this is Peter Pan. In more theatrical versions, the part is expected to be played by a woman. Fast forward to when the term drag was actually coined. In the late 1800s, men noted that their skirts would literally drag across the floor because they were so long and heavy. The name stuck and drag was born? In the early 1900s, traveling vaudeville acts became more popular across America, and drag queens are undeniably the most popular attraction of this time. There are a lot of really great drag queens that came out of this period that we unfortunately just don't have the time to talk about right now. The next major milestone came in the 1960s. One of the most memorable drag queens of that time is none other than Vaginal Davis. Vaginal Davis used what Munoz calls terrorist drag to combat the Black Panther movement, and it created new discourses around black lives, drag, and black power. She once described her drag as parodying a lot of things. It wasn't an intellectual thing, it was innate. A lot of academics and intellectuals dismissed it because it wasn't smart enough. It was too homey, a little too country, and gay drag queens hated me. They didn't understand it. I wasn't really trying to alter myself to look like a real woman. I didn't wear false eyelashes or fake breasts. It wasn't about the realness of traditional drag, the perfect flawless makeup. I just put on a little lipstick, a little eyeshadow, a wig, and I went out there. Because of Vaginal Davis and queens like her, the realm of possibility opened for many other queens. Their actions and voices gave today's drag queens the freedom to be whoever they want to be. So where is drag today? Well, I mentioned before there are a lot of different kinds of drag. The two most visible styles are the glamour queen and the clown. That's not to say that you can't be a mix of both, honey. For those of you who may not know, glamour queens focus first on transforming into a supermodel type of woman. The clowns feel their look is just as important but they are more comedic and looking for their laughs in their performance. As one of my favorite clown queens, Trixie Mattel, once said, With drag, it's like, your name should be A, memorable, and B, it should have to do with you. Hearing the name Bob the Drag Queen tells you everything you need to know about what you're about to hear, because it's hilarious, and it's basically a man in a wig. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some examples from RuPaul's Best Friend Race, shall we?
what's the point? I mean, there is none. The whole point of drag is to feel more comfortable in your body. No matter what you decide to do, drag or not, it's all about performing your gender the way that you feel is most comfortable. Because after all, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you going to love anybody else? Can I get an amen?